Hello, in this video we're going to be talking about the equations of simple harmonic motion. We're going to be going over nearly all of the equations in the simple harmonic motion. Additional higher level subtopic, all the fun math you get to get into in HL physics. Um, we're going to go over pretty much all of these quickly except for the first two which define angular frequency and the definition of simple harmonic motion which is right here. All right, so assuming you're good with those, we're going to go over the rest. So here we go. All right, so the first equation, there's you'll notice there's two of them. Um, and we'll talk about what that means and what the IB is getting at here. But let's take the first one just for an example where we're looking at the a position function or displacement of a particle that's oscillating. All right, and so what we see when we look at this stuff is that if we were to plot, say with a motion sensor, if we were to plot the displacement of a... Uh, object in simple harmonic motion over time we would see its motion is sinusoidal a sine function would perfectly model the motion of a simple harmonic oscillator um, all right so we're going to use a sine function and um, if you need any math help with the math of a sine function there are some resources on Schoology but a simple sine graph sine of uh, omega t We'll plot what happens to the displacement of the particle as it moves. So here are the variables in your data booklet equation. X represents the displacement, of course, of the particle as a function of time. So this will give me the position or displacement, really, at any given time. Given some initial amplitude, uh, the angular frequency of my oscillator and the time that I care to look at. Right, so of course, if we plot this versus T, we get a nice, perfect sine graph. Very, very exciting. Uh, you want to be okay with the idea that the height of this graph is the amplitude of the sine function, and so this is my amplitude. All right, so on the graph here, one centimeter will be the amplitude. This thing goes up a centimeter, comes back to equilibrium, goes down a centimeter, so on, so on. Classic oscillation. All right, what you do want to be able to do is translate this graph to create the next two graphs. Uh, if you are taking calculus, that's pretty easy. Um, even if you're not taking calculus, it shouldn't be too hard at this point in your physics career to go from a displacement versus time graph to a velocity versus time graph. Of course, we're going to look at the slope of a tangent line. We're going to look at the gradient of the graph, right? Remember, uh, calculus students, that's code word for derivative, but you do not need to do any calculus in IB physics. All right. So as always, you want to draw a tangent line because the rate of change of, uh, fire displacement is velocity. And so just for example, if you kind of forget, you'll notice there's a pattern here. But if you're not sure of the pattern, you can always do this. You can always look at your graph and say, okay, right here, if I have a sine function at time zero, it's got a positive slope. So my velocity is positive. And sometime over here, uh, maybe a quarter of the way through the cycle, I have zero. My tangent line has a slope of zero, right? The rate of change of position is momentarily zero. And so my velocity is zero. And then so on, so on. I can come here to this fun point where the displacement is zero and the slope is negative. So I have a negative velocity, uh, again, a zero and a zero. And look at that. I go positive zero, negative zero. And knowing what I know about oscillations, I know it's also going to be a sine type of wave. And in fact, here, if you know your graphs, that's a cosine. Starts at a maximum. Goes like this. So it looks like when I do my gradient stuff on a sine wave, that turns into a cosine function. All right, again, calculus students, you see what's happening. Just for fun, calc students, you probably, you hopefully also see why this omega shows up out in front. But again, if you're not a calc student, that's okay, because the IB just gives you the solution. Here you go. So this is the velocity function as a function of time. So the couple things to notice here, everything in front of your... Uh, in front of your trig function is the amplitude. So two meters per second is the amplitude of this function. And that must be equal to this whole product out front, the angular frequency times the displacement. Another way to say that is your maximum velocity is equal to your angular velocity times the maximum displacement. And again, if you know a little bit about angular velocity, hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Um, Angular frequency, rather, I should say, since we're looking at something oscillating. Okay. Um, we can follow the same process then, and if you do, I uh, encourage you to do the exercise. Try 
to think about your gradients. See if you can convince yourself that a cosine wave turns into a negative sine wave when you do the same process. And this would be the function that you get for acceleration. This one, not in the data booklet, but I'll show you what they do give you. Um, all right, but again, here's my amplitude. So just for fun, I can think of the maximum acceleration as this, which especially given our definition of simple harmonic motion uh, seems right since, uh, since uh, acceleration is negative angular frequency squared times displacement. It sure makes sense that maximum acceleration I could find with this. That all works over here. The other thing to notice, the exciting thing, look at this x sub zero sine of omega t what did i start with x sub zero sine of omega t that's x that whole thing is x and so what i get is this the acceleration is equal to negative omega squared times x that's where this comes from the definition of harmonic motion and it turns out if i have an acceleration function that depends on the position the only kind of function where that happens where you take the uh gradient let's say twice and get back the same function with some extra extra juju out front that's some kind of sinusoidal function okay so those are three equations um now the thing that's tricky is how do i know which one to use because this is how they write it in the data booklet right they just give you all this stuff next to each other well that's because the ib knows well the ib doesn't expect you to do calculus and so um it just depends on your initial conditions all right, so what you want to do, here are the tips for using these equations. They go together. So the equations on top of each other go together. So the one we looked at is, is if our displacement is a sine function, then the velocity is a cosine function. So these two would go together. So it depends on your starting position. So if, you, um, if you're starting at a position of zero, let's say, if you start, if the particle starts at equilibrium at t equals zero, then you have a sine function for your displacement and so velocity will be this cosine function however if you start with say the particle all the way up at its maximum then you have a cosine function and so you can do the same process convince yourself that the velocity would be a negative sine function all right so these equations you use together these you use together you have to use your physics brain to decide which set of equations you might be interested in using to, based on the initial conditions of the system all right, the good news is, uh, of course, you could start like in between. You could start not at zero, not at the maximum, and have some kind of phase shift term in here, but the IB is not going to mess with that. They should only give you problems where you're, at least problems where you have to do math. You should only ever be starting at equilibrium or starting at your maximum uh, displacement, aka starting up all the way at the amplitude of displacement. All right, so these go together, these go together. That's how you use those. Okay, last couple equations. There is a big equation in here um, for uh, velocity in terms of displacement. That's essentially what this equation is. There is a derivation. It's in the cognitive textbook. I think we have it on Schoology. You can find it out on the, on the internet. Um, you can derive this equation, but again, the IB just gives it to you, so we won't get into it. Um, a couple things about this equation that's a little funky. The thing that's nice about it is there's no t. So you can use this equation if you happen to know where you are in your oscillation and you don't necessarily know the time or want to use t. So you could put in, you know, if I'm one centimeter away from my equilibrium position, what's the velocity at that displacement? Because it should always be the same. Rather, I guess we should say the speed is always the same, but remember you could be going up or you could be going down or you could be going left or you could be going right. So you need to use, again, your physics brain. You need to look at the situation and think about, based on the context of the problem or the situation, which way is it moving, and you assign a plus or a minus. All right, so this notation is a little weird, but it doesn't mean uncertainty or anything like that. It means the answer could be positive or negative, and you need to decide. The math will not tell you whether it's positive or negative. So you need to use the context of the problem to decide the direction. But otherwise, everything is the same. You just plug in the displacement of the particle at the time you care about and find the velocity at that same time. Nice convenient equation if you remember it's there. They then go on to use this equation to come up with the rest. So there's an equation for kinetic energy. And what they do is they take our classic equation that defines the kinetic energy of a mass moving with a certain speed v. And we plug in this whole function for v. And bam, here's what we get. 
is square everything. So that becomes squared, square root goes away. Now I have a nice equation for kinetic energy in terms of position as well, so you can figure out how much kinetic energy you have. Fun stuff you can do with this, and a good conceptual exercise, I guess, is you could think, okay, up at the pop, uh, most positive maximum uh, displacement, where x is x0, where my displacement is equal to the amplitude, this whole thing turns into zero. Ask yourself that question, does it make sense that the kinetic energy is zero when you're all the way at the extreme end of your oscillation? Hopefully it does. And uh, another good question to ask yourself, when is this a maximum? When do you get the most kinetic energy? Does that make sense? Well, I think the answer to that would be when x is zero. And again, when we're going through equilibrium, we know that's when our oscillator is moving the fastest. In other words, all of the energy of a harmonic oscillator is kinetic at the equilibrium position. There's no potential energy, none of the energy is stored, it's all in that thing moving through equilibrium. So the total energy is equal to the kinetic energy when x equals zero. So I could plug that in to yet again use all this stuff and derive another equation for total energy. So here you go, here this equation gives you the total energy of your simple harmonic oscillator. Very nice, convenient equation to use. Notice it depends on only a few things, the mass of the object oscillating, the angular frequency of the system, and the amplitude of the oscillation. Right, so pull that spring down further. It's got more total energies. It bounces back and forth. That's the idea. All right, so these three equations really are all tied together. They're all in the data booklet. So it's just about, you know, knowing what your variables are, when to use them. And last two equations are pretty straightforward. They give you the period of a pendulum and the period of a mass spring. Um, both of them depend on two pi and some kind of square rooted fraction. So the period of a pendulum depends only on the length of the pendulum and the gravitational field strength, which you're not changing unless you go to another planet or go out in space or something, All right? Um, and the period of a spring depends only on the mass uh, hanging from the spring and the spring constant of your spring, of course. Uh, remember for both of these, the amplitude has no effect on the period. We should maybe say for a pendulum, this is a small angle approximation. So if you pull that pendulum to like 90 degrees or something, things start getting wonky. But under 10 degrees or so, this is a very good approximation. Um, and all pendulum problems you see, this will be fine to use. All right, but neither of these depend on amplitude. The, a pendulum, it doesn't even matter how much mass is on the end of the pendulum, the period is always the same. All right, the other thing that you'll commonly see, I got a two pi, I got a period. There is lots of angular frequency stuff you can do and even equations that you'll find elsewhere that tie the idea of angular frequency to these kind of square roots, maybe upside down. All right, so that's another fun thing you can do with all these equations. But there you go. Th those are all these equations, how to use them, how to decode your data booklet. That's one of the most important things you can do to be successful on the exams and uh, with physics in general is know how to use all of these tools. So hopefully that helps as you go on your problem solving adventures. Have fun.